smile on your face when you start chopping all that stuff down with that. Well, he wasn't kidding either. It was fun. I said to keep the dog away, otherwise I'd chop its legs off. That thing literally would cut through, <laughs> gone. No, I wasn't planning on doing it. I just, I kept the dog locked up. Have to, those things, that dog will run after anything. Anything. All right, Acts chapter 18. We are going to talk about the Apostle Paul tonight and his first convert. Well, they're not really his converts. I believe they were already saved before Paul got there. Um, I, I don't think that Paul was the one that was involved with their conversion. I think that when Paul met uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, or Aquila and Priscilla, when he met them, I think they were already converted. Uh, and there's, I'll kind of explain the background of this a little bit to you tonight and give you some understanding of what's happening. We're only going to get through a few verses here tonight, but what we're going to get a good understanding is, is Paul as the tradesman. And I titled this Paul the tradesman, not the college man. Uh, and, and I did that for a number of reasons because Paul here shows what I believe is the proper mode or the proper operation of church planting and, and just what that church planting pastor uh, is supposed to be doing and how it's supposed to be done. I think this simplest form of church planting, this simplest form of the work that the Apostle Paul did, it, it cuts through a lot of bureaucracy, it cuts through a lot of the other things that keeps a man off the field and keeps a man, you know, away from uh, the calling that God has for him. So I think there's an example here that we can see very clearly, but also to correct some, uh, uh, some errors that's there, because some people take this as that, that the Apostle Paul was stating that pastors should not be supported and that they should all be tent makers and that every season is the same and everything is the same. But that's not true because Paul shows us elsewhere that he, as he's talking to these very Corinthians, he explains his position to them. He explains what he had done. So, in other words, we'll basically get a good understanding tonight of a correction and an overcorrection that takes place, uh, which is constantly what happens in the Christian life. We will correct things, but sometimes we will overcorrect things. We'll go too far. There have been things in my life that I have, in my ministry, that I have corrected or that I have overcorrected and had to come back towards the, that narrow way, that center way a little bit, and understand that that, that had gone too far. And you're going to find that in parenting as well. And in every area of your life, you're going to go too far sometimes and have to correct some things and come back because you were trying to combat something else. Life is about balances, uh, scriptural balances of understanding. Acts chapter 18 and verse number 2, And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. So Paul is this tent maker here. And we're going to find out exactly how that all ties in. Like, how did Paul become a tent maker here? And, and this will give you kind of a background here and some understanding tonight and practically apply it to the young men that we have right here. And it will help, uh, help you to understand some things as well, scripturally, that the example is given right here for us. Father, we thank you for the words of God. We thank you for this King James Bible. Help us to faithfully preach it, teach it, and live it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First, let's look at, at these people, this uh, Aquila and Priscilla, these, uh, these Christians that they are found in. David Cloud notes in his Way of Life uh, commentary series, he says that they had been driven out of Italy because of Caesar's persecution against the Jews. Now, I think it's interesting that God uses every situation to guide his people in his will. God even used that persecution that those Jews went through, those saved Jews that they went through. Now, I'll explain to you why that persecution took place 
we'll get a little bit in depth with that. It's always nice to have a background so you can kind of understand you read one verse and you hear something. Well, you know, is there any more about this, this, how Claudius, how he had sent every, all the Jews away? Like, why did he do that? Well, I'll show you tonight why he did that. Give you some understanding of that so you can see that. This is a continuation of the persecution of the Jews that began with the Babylonian captivity. Jews were always persecuted, and they always will be till Christ returns. That's the way it's going to be. Most Jews did not return to Israel at the end of the 70-year captivity, but they remained among the Gentile nations. Persecution, the lust for commerce, and search for liberty spread them throughout the earth over the next 2,500 years. When the Roman Emperor Claudius evicted the Jews from Rome, this was the first of many evictions. For example, they were evicted from England in 1290, from Spain in 1492, and from Russia in the 1880s. I think this is a very interesting point that sometimes things befall us and happen to us and we have no idea why. There are things that happen in your life and you have no idea why. You may assume at the time that those things happen, you have a good idea of why these things are happening. But that's not the case. We don't know. When we go through severe trials and heartache and pain and different things, we don't know why God's allowing that. But we have to surrender and submit to that because we have no idea what God's doing. Here, uh, Aquila and Priscilla had no idea that they'd be a part of the greatest expansion of the New Testament churches in history. They had no idea that this dispersion from Rome would bring that about, that they would be a part of that that God would use them so greatly, and he did use them greatly. All of our lives can be summed up in this, that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All of the saved can claim that because that is their life. That's what God does. The trying of our faith, I said this on a, on a Facebook uh, post, the trying of our faith is meant to do just that. It's to try us. It's to try that faith. And what Satan means for evil, God always means for your good. There is no attack from Satan that does not benefit the child of God, that does not teach him simple childlike faithfulness to the Lord through all his struggles or her struggles. The attack was designed by Satan to shake your faith, but it's allowed by God to shape you into being what God wants you to be. God knows when his people are being persecuted and he uses it still for his glory. See, Caesar, he banished these Jews who happened to be Christians. He had no idea he would even be a tool used by God to plant many churches. The, the lost, have, they have no idea what they're doing when they persecute God's people or they go against the Lord's churches. They have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea that they're being used by God to do what they're doing. And that there will, be an, there, there will be an end that will be good for the people of God. Always. Always. It's happened forever. And it will continue until, until eternity. You know, hate will always be in the world. And that special hate for the Jews will always be there. Until Christ comes and he rules on his throne. But again, there's, there's some history there. The Roman historian Sutenios in AD 69 to AD 122 is when he lived. He mentions early Christians and may refer to Jesus Christ in his works of the lives of the 12 Caesars. One passage in the biography of the Emperor Claudius, Divus Claudius 25, refers to agitations in the Roman Jewish community and the expulsion of Jews from Rome by Claudius during his reign, which may be the expulsion mentioned in Acts chapter 18. In this context, Cresto is mentioned. Some scholars see this as a likely reference to Christ, while others see it as referring to an otherwise unknown person. Josephus spoke also of 8,000 Jews petitioning Caesar. So there was a lot of high Jewish presence in, in Rome at the time. It is well known that when Jewish Christians preached the gospel, unconverted Jews would come along and stir up trouble and cause riots and tumults. So if you're in Rome and you have Christians there, Right, Christians, Jews that are converted to Christ. Then you have the other Jews. Remember, because what, what was Paul's normal method of doing things? He would go into the synagogue. He would preach to the Jews. Some would get saved. Others would get mad. 
right? And they would stir up a tumult against Paul, and they would cause an uprising in the Jewish community. And therefore, the rulers of Rome and other cities would expel those Jews and the Christians out of the city. They didn't know the difference in what they believed. So the Christians always got it worse. They always expelled them. They stirred up trouble. So that's exactly what happened in Rome. These Christians, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, they had to leave. They had to leave Rome. They, Claudius had, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. It didn't matter who they were. So then these two must have been saved before, but it's their trade that brought them into contact with the Apostle Paul. David Cloud goes on to say, It appears that Aquila and Priscilla were already believers in Christ before they met Paul. The gospel was probably brought to Rome soon after Pentecost by the Jews who had traveled to Jerusalem to attend the feast and who heard the gospel there. Remember in Acts chapter 2, we went through that in Pentecost. All the Jews were from all over the world. All those proselytes were there. They got saved and they spread the gospel everywhere. They left there. God used Pentecost and they left and they went everywhere, spreading the word wherever they went. So we understand that by Acts chapter 2 that that's what took place. Some stayed, large groups stayed, others left. Uh, like uh, the eunuch, he went back home. Others went back home. They took the gospel with them wherever they went. So then the gospel would be spread all over the place. So those Jews would go into those saved Jews that were converted. I mean, Pentecost was a Jewish festival, feast, right? If you understand that. So that was what God used to preach the gospel to them. When Peter, when they were all gathered together and Peter gave his sermon and thousands were saved. Well, those thou not all of them stayed. Some of them left and went back. Next, we think about Paul the tent maker. It's worth noting that Paul was a tradesman and he wasn't a college man. Now, that doesn't mean that Paul wasn't educated because Paul was very educated. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, right? And he learned of him. So, so we understand that, that he was. But Jewish boys were taught at the age of 12 to learn a trade of some sort. They had to learn to work with their hands. One rabbi said it this way. He said, he that teaches not his son a trade is as if he taught him to be a thief. Pretty powerful. I think that's pretty powerful. I think it makes a lot of sense too, doesn't it? And another says, he that has a trade in his hand is as a vineyard that is fenced. That's what the Jews believed. So that's why when you saw Christ at 12 years old, where was he at? Where? He was a carpenter, that's right. But where was he at first when he was 12 years old, though? In the temple. And what did they ask him at 12 years old when he was in the temple? His mother, where have you been? Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said, wist you not that I must be about my father's business? Capital F. What was he saying? Well, my earthly dad may have me being a carpenter. My father's business is right here in this temple because he was God. Now see the, the hypostatic union there, right? See, with his hands he worked as a carpenter, but he was the son of God. See that? But he was 12 years old at the time. So that's what, so, so Jewish boys at that time, at 12 years old, notice it doesn't say Jewish girls. Doesn't say Jewish girls. Right? Why? Well, because that's not what they did. That's not what God intended them to do. God explained in the scriptures what he intended those girls to do, those young ladies to do, right? So he explained very clearly. Christ was called the carpenter's son. He learned that carpentry work. So then Jewish boys were taught a trade, and Paul was no different. By the way, young men ought to think about this very strongly. I have seen so many people wasting their life on college degrees that rack up debt and never earn any money with it. They never learn much. And worse yet, I see Christians supporting this nonsense in something called Bible college. And I know I hit that quite a bit, but I hit that quite a bit now because I have a lot of young men that are coming up in this church 
And I want you to emphatically understand that I think Bible college is one of the biggest bunch of nonsense and money-making schemes that big bodies, bucks, and buildings pastors have invented to build their, business, their, their ministries, their businesses, as they are CEOs of their companies and to, and to have assets for their company. That's really what I believe. Now, does that mean that no good came from it? No, I didn't say that. Lots of good comes from it. But that doesn't mean it's right. Right? It doesn't mean it's God's way. You show me that, that model in the scriptures. You won't find it anywhere. Right? I've seen, I, I've seen these young men go off to Bible college, have no interest or no calling of God for anything. They go off into those Bible colleges. They rack up a bunch of debt. And they come out of there after four years, or maybe five. Um, they come out of there, and what do they have? Nothing. I would say they have a Bible degree, and yeah, they do, but I've heard a lot of them preach, and it's not very impressive. Like, it's really depressing, to be honest with you. And they all sound the same, but anyway, um, that's, that's another point. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, they have, these, they have these, right, and they send them off to there, and they do that. Well, what do we see Paul doing? The opposite. Paul learned to trade. I've heard pastors teaching young people to go off to big Baptist colleges and get a degree. Every young person should go to Bible college for one year. Thus saith Opinions 316. Right? No, no one ever asks us, well, pastor, is it anywhere in here? Like, anywhere? Like, it never dawned on anybody that went through that to ever ask that question, I guess. Like, did you ever find it in here? At all? Did you ever think to look in here for it? No, it's just part of the program, so you just follow it. But you know what's, you know what's been the greatest? I need to start. I need to write that. I need hindrances to church planning. I need to write that. Um, I preached it many years ago, 10 years ago, but... You know, here's the thing. One of those is, is the Bible college model. It is absolutely a hindrance to church planting. Absolutely. Absolutely a hindrance to church planting. No scriptural merit for it at all. Even if you don't believe you're called to ministry, they say you should go. I believe the opposite. I believe young men that, that believe they are called to ministry should be like Christ and Paul, and they should go learn a trade. That's what I think they should do. I, th I think you should go learn a trade. I think you should, or, or, and find a way to make money. Why? Because you're going to need it. Because if you're preaching this book, you're going to need a trade. In this world, you're going to need one. If you're going to preach this book straight, yep, you're going to need a trade. You're going to need some way to make money with your own hands. Right? I don't care what, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm just telling you that the Waldensies did the same thing. They, ped, they made their wares and they peddled their wares and they sold them to, to fund themselves to go through everywhere. It's, now, I'm not saying that anybody that goes to college is wrong, although I think you're wasting money going to Bible college. I just honestly do. I think it's a big waste of money and a lot of other things. But, um, but anyway, the, but like going to college for a degree in accounting or whatever business, or what, I don't, I'm not saying that's wrong. Just use it. If you have any thought in your mind that you're not going to use it, don't go. Because you're going to waste money. Waste resources. Don't do it. I think young men ought to learn a trade. I think that's absolutely what they ought to do. There's tradesmen are going to be needed. They're needed now, and they're going to be needed more. Right? doesn't matter what it is. But follow, follow that ability to be able to work. Whether it's a, There's a lot of older men in this church right now that, that are electricians and linemen and truck drivers and, 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 and all these other positions, right? Uh, accounting or whatever, you know, uh, all these other things. Learn something that you can do that's practical, that is needed, that is necessary, right? Because you never know when you're going to need it. Right, whether it's plumbing or or carpentry work or anything like that, you're you don't know when you're going to need that. 
And young men ought to think about that, especially if you believe that you ought to go in the ministry. You, you ought to, you know what I think a lot of young men would slow their lives down quite a bit. And in this day and age, I'm going to say something to you that, man, I'm going all over the place here. But, but I, it, follow me here a little bit. I, I don't believe in this day and age that we live in, I don't believe in long courtships. I just do not believe in that. I do not. Why? Temptation. <laughs> this world. The way it is. Also, I believe that you children, you young children, are being trained to be wives, you ladies, and you young men are being trained to be husbands. And I, and I come from, I, I believe that if you make that decision before God, if you've sought your parents' advice, if you've sought good counsel, if you've done things the right way, if you've done all of those things, I don't see any reason to, to, to stretch that thing out forever. Because guess what? Nothing's going to be perfect. Nothing. Even though you think you both will be perfect when you look at each other right away, then you'll figure out you're not a little bit later. <laughs> Right. I don't believe I don't believe in that. Th those. Uh, why? Because I think it leaves too much. But I will say this. I think that you young men, if you want to prepare for your life like that, then you get a trade. You get buckled down when the time comes. You get through it and you get on your way to being able to provide. That's what I believe you do. That's what mature men do. You don't need to go out and find yourself. You need to lose yourself. Amen. Okay. The Apostle Paul, he learned as a young man that tent-making skill. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Paul often worked to support himself. Acts chapter 20. Turn there. Acts chapter 20. We're going to talk a little bit about that, the support of uh, Paul and how he dealt with things. Acts chapter 20, verse number 34. Paul said, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. So Paul not only worked to, for himself, but he worked to help others in that sense. As an apostle, he was a little different. But Jewish boys, including those in training to be rabbis, they were taught a trade. Just remember, Paul finds himself in a place where he needs to make money, right? He goes into an area of planting a church where Christ was not named. Timothy and Silas, the scriptures later on tell us, Timothy and Silas had not come with the funds to provide for Paul. So Paul is looking to preach to these people in Corinth. Do you think the Apostle Paul wants to get out a bucket and ask these people for money while he's preaching Christ? No. So what does he do? He looks for a way to make money, to provide so he could preach while he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to get there with the funds from other churches, remember Paul said, I robbed other churches to do you service. He was waiting for that. So he says, you know what? I'm just going to go to work. And what happens? Paul's willing to work. So Paul gets there. He's willing to do that work. And what does God? God leads him. Paul says, well, I'm a tent maker. I know how to make tents. And he finds these people, Aquila and Priscilla, and he finds them and they're tent makers. There are times in the ministry when a pastor must support himself. The first four or five years of this ministry, I worked full-time and I pastored full-time. There's no such thing as pastoring part-time. It doesn't, doesn't happen. There's no such thing as a part-time pastor, ever. But I did both. Right? Why? Because it was, it was, it was, there was a necessity, right, that had, to be, that had to be taken care of. There was partial support coming in from ascending church, and there, as there should be. But there's going to be a time in the beginning where if you're laboring with your own two hands, it'll be absolutely necessary that you do that to plant churches. It just will be. You're not going to, generally speaking, that's not going to happen. You're not going to be fully funded anytime when it comes to those things. So Paul decides that, that he will go to work with them. We'll get more into that in a second. The third point I want to make to you, though, tonight is that Paul was not swearing off pastors being supported or fully supported. That isn't what he's saying. 
Herein lies the great excuse and accusations many make at churches that support their own pastor. Right. So many today take this text out of context as if it's the only text in the Bible concerning the support of pastors. And they believe there's some virtue in them seeing to it that their pastor does not become too proud or well taken care of. So they'll be the means of humbling him and his family by keeping them in the poorhouse to teach them. You, I mean, I'm telling you that. Spurgeon talked about people that had that mentality in England at the time. Um, some of the separate Baptists had that mentality, literally saw the, the wives of those, of those pastors starving almost to their shame. And, uh, you know, uh, Colonel Samuel Harris preached that very hard. Colonel Samuel Harris was, a, was saved in the Sandy Creek Revival. He planted many churches. He was a well-off man. He was wealthy. Well, he came passing through one time uh, to one of the old pastors or one of the young pastor's houses, and he stopped off there and asked the lady if, if she had any water, and she said, yeah, do you have any food for the horses? Or anything? And she said, no, we don't have any. And he looked around, and everything was, like, overgrown, and, they, they, and he said, well, do you have any food? Could I get some bread or some food? And she didn't have any. And he said, why, why don't you have anything? He says, because cause my husband's out preaching. And they didn't, they didn't collect the offerings because they didn't want to be like the Church of England or the forced, the forced uh, taxation uh, on people that they had in New England. So they, what did they do? They overcorrected, went all the way the other way. That changed that day. It changed Colonel Samuel Harris, but the damage had been done for 20 years of that teaching. So you, you got to be careful that you follow the scriptures and not get hyped up into what's going on around you. It's very important that those, that, that the Bible is followed. You know, nothing could be further from the truth though, about this text. Uh, by the way, the opposite, that's the opposite of loving and honoring not to take care of someone. It is right for preachers to be supported. Turn to first Corinthians chapter nine. We've talked about this before, but it's important to go through these verses quickly and just remember them. Am I not an apostle? Am I, am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am with you. I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, Cephas was Peter. Peter had a wife. Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? So the law is the same. He's saying that didn't change in the New Testament. For it is written under the, in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thre thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Amen. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things as we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul was an example. He's saying, I'm not going to do this because of what God called me. Remember, God said, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. But Paul did in certain areas do that, though. Because he apologizes them later on that he wasn't chargeable unto them like he should have been. He said, I, I, I wasn't chargeable unto you like I, I should have been. I robbed other churches to do you service. Because he was so concerned for his testimony. Which is not a bad thing, by the way. Right? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel. Let me back up. Verse 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? 
Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. Paul's saying, I'm not writing this for my benefit. He's writing it for the others that would come. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Amen. But Paul explains that. He explains his examination of them. He explains why he did what he did. But he also explains that it was God ordained that a preacher or pastor should be cared for. Amen. That that's God's plan. That's God's way. That's the way he designed it. Uh, 1 Timothy, turn there. Chapter 5. He talks about the elder in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. Now, why is he saying that? Well, because he talks earlier on about widows and about honoring widows that are widows indeed. Those are widows that their husbands died in the faith. They were in the faith. They died in the faith. And there is an honor in the church that is to be given to those widows. They're to be taken care of. But he goes on to say it to make sure in verse 17, he says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. See the difference? He explains the order, the proper procedure, the proper way things are to be taken care of in the church um, and, and, and what they're supposed to do. So he gives that exhortation again uh, it's it's interesting that he gives that again in the pastoral epistles so he writes them there in the pastoral epistles so they understand what's proper in the church he talks about it in corinthians you know he explains the corinthians that because of all the uproar and everything that's going on the reason why paul didn't take any money from them is because they were laying accusations at him they were throwing things down and they were lying about him people were saying things about him false apostles false workers they were coming in so paul's like i'm not gonna take nothing from any of you because he said, I'm going to prove that God's going to take care of me, and that's just the way it's going to be. So that's why he did it. Then he robbed other churches. Other churches heard about it and said, okay, well, we'll take care of Paul. Right? The preacher should always also be willing to work like Paul when necessary. A lazy man is not qualified to be a preacher or a church leader. You see, it's not always cut and dry. Every situation is not the same. There are seasons in life that are different. There are some seasons when it may be expedient, it may be necessary for a pastor to work with his own hands and do extra things, right? It may come in my life in the future where I need to do that, right? Where some things may come up. Now, it's better for you if I don't do that. It's better for you if I'm not distracted. It's better for you that my focus is here and my attention is on the flock and my attention is not distracted into something else of necessity that I have to do, right? But that doesn't mean I wouldn't be willing to do it. Because the preacher is, is a man that has to take care of responsibilities. It's the same, right? So that's important. You know, picture this scenario. Paul comes to this city preaching, right? He's there in this city what's he going to do? He has no choice. He's not about to ask a bunch of pagans for money. And the same people he's preaching to, he's not about to ask them for anything. So he doesn't. This would discredit his message. He would make it of none effect. You know, they weren't a nation with Christian believers like America or like England was in years gone by, right? So the Lord allowed him to find this Christian couple who made tents. By the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, we talked about this, but the preacher should not allow anything to hinder his ministry. So if money is an issue like that, he shouldn't allow it to hinder his ministry. He should work and do what he has to do and just continue on. 
Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul said, woe, woe be unto him if he preached not the gospel. He's like, I'm going to do it anyway. Right? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7 through 12, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. See, here's where the other guys that say, See, Paul was a tent maker. His whole ministry never took any money. Well, did you read the other? Oh, you missed that. On purpose? On purpose. Why? Usually the men that I find in churches that have the most problem with supporting a pastor are very covetous men. Yes. They love money a lot. Yep. They mask it in different ways, but they really love money so much that they don't want to support a pastor. But they, they mask it in different ways, you know, so they, but it, it all comes, it, it eventually comes down to covetousness. That's what it ends up coming down to. That's why they have such a dog in the fight when it comes to that. I mean, they make a bigger deal of it than what I would. <laughs> it, and they do. He said, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Paul just determined it. He dug his heels and he's like, I'm not asking you for a thing. Because they, they accused him. And he's like, nope, won't do it. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. That wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. So he says, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give him the satisfaction of it. So he he went to other churches and they took care of him. Right? Paul knew that he was gonna be criticized, he knew what was coming, he knew what they were doing, so he just opted out of it. He said, you know, I'm no, I'll just take care of it. I'll go to some other church. Then God used it. God used other churches. Right? And in the beginning of Paul's ministry there, when he first came there, though, when he's with Priscilla and Aquila and he's making tents, he, he doesn't have any, he doesn't have a flock yet. There's no church there, right? So in the beginning of a pastor's ministry, most of the time, it, there's not a necessity that he doesn't work. You know, because he, he just doesn't need, the, there's not a flock to give all the attention to at that time, right? But as the church, as the Lord grows the church, and as things happen, like it has here, the necessity comes in that they need your attention, right? And and that we would give, be given over to the labor and to labor and word and doctrine. That's where the labor needs to be now. That's where the focus needs to be, right? So no man should give up because of money. No man should quit serving God because of money. I have seen people do that. I have seen churches do that. I've seen them, or I've seen pastors give up and quit because of money and bills and things of that nature. And I'm like, who called you? Who called you? Right? If I believed for one second that I had to depend on all of you in that sense and not on God, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Right? Because it's God that supplies the needs. Yes, he uses you, but I'll be honest with you. If you get, if you get crosswise and you get, and you get crossways about things and you don't, and you don't do right, God's going to use somebody else. Amen. I'm telling you what, I've watched it. I've seen it. God will use somebody else for it. And you'll be robbed of the blessing of it. God will use somebody else. He'll get He'll take care of his, his preacher, and he'll take care of his church. Man, does he ever. In the most unlikely ways you could never imagine. And I, to make me sometimes feel like, how in the world did that happen? 
You explain to me, a man that makes the money that I make, that God allowed me to sell a house and pay off two vehicles like that. Cash. I can't tell you how many times. When you tell me about your business and everything else, you just need to keep praying. You just keep praying and you just keep trusting God. And you keep your eyes on Christ and you keep begging God to give you what you need. Don't you dare beg any customer or beg any other man. I will beg you to get saved by the grace of God, but I will never beg you for money. Ever. I will beg God for money. I will get on my face before God and beg him for it. But I won't do it for man. I won't. I just won't. I, I, just, I, I won't do it. And don't you ever do it either because you don't have to. You have a Father in heaven that will take care of you. You don't, need any, you don't need any schemes of man or anything else. God will take care of you. By the way, but I can see that God has blessed the people of this church because they are giving. I hear about other places. You hear about people having problems with jobs. I mean, you explain all the blessings that this church has and the, and the, because God blesses faithfulness. He, some of you have lived by that principle your whole life, and you can testify, yep. Given to the Lord, God blesses. I've never, you'll never outgive God. You never will. In so many ways, you never will. Just look around you. Look at all these children, and you go to churches, and they don't have any kids at all. They have nothing. They're dying on the vine. Amen. Children are a heritage of the Lord. Amen. If you think about that, it's all the Lord's. Paul, he was willing to work for it. So should every pastor be willing to. Any time in the ministry, any time, whether it's 10 years from now. Right? See, for me, it isn't a problem. Like, God taught me how to make money. <laughs> so I... I can do it. I just don't like to do it. I don't like my brain to go that way. I, I shut that off. Because it's like, because preachers don't lack opportunity to make money. There's always something we could do. But I just, I kind of shut that off. I don't want that to be on. Because then it, it, it's, it, it distracts me. It's very distracting. You know, very distracting. Next, Aquila and Priscilla, they were co-labors with Paul. They became co-workers with Paul, and they're mentioned several other times in the scriptures. They started churches in their home. Turn to Romans chapter 16. By the way, you know what? These people were not, this, uh, Aquila was not a pastor. It never says anywhere he was a pastor. But he allowed that church to meet in his home. He said, you know what, I'll use my home We'll use my home for God's glory. Amen. Romans chapter 16, verse number three. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Amen. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. The church met in their house. Amen. It's a godly couple right there. How about in 1 Corinthians 16? The churches of Asia, verse number 19, the churches of Asia, Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Amen. This is a godly couple. A godly marriage, it's so important today, isn't it? Amen. If you would see churches planted and souls saved and lives changed, we've got to be godly couples. We've got to have a godly marriage. It should be that any one of, any church or any group or anything should be able to be in your home, and it shouldn't be defiling, it shouldn't be a problem at all. You should be living for God in such a way that that wouldn't be a problem. Amen! It should never be a problem. There's nothing on this earth that can stop a married couple if they'll serve Christ. You realize that, don't you? There isn't a thing on this earth that can stop you 
if you'll serve Christ. If you'll be one flesh and you'll follow the Lord, there is not one thing on this earth that can stop you. But that, that decision's up to you. You have to follow that. God will protect your marriage. He'll protect your children. He'll give power and their seed will be blessed. You know, the Bible never mentions that these two had children. Maybe they couldn't. But they gave themselves to the service of the Lord. They helped Paul. They labored with him night and day to see churches planted. They allowed their home to be used for God's glory. If they had property, they wanted to use it to start a church to meet in their home. They served the Lord together. The Bible mentions Priscilla a couple times before Aquila. Perhaps, you know, uh, she was able to do a little bit more because she was at home. You know, perhaps she was able to do more. Maybe he was doing business and he had to be out and doing other things. But it mentions. And by, why is that important? Because it's important that ladies are godly. It's important. You're, you have a gospel ministry. You have an important gospel ministry. Your example means something. It, it has an impact. Right. People watch you. I my wife gave me a call the other day. I don't remember what I think it was Monday. And she said that she was at at Walmart or someplace, and this Muslim lady walked up to her and saw her and commented on the fact that they that her and my daughters were dressed modestly, and she said, "I like the fact that you're that 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 you're covered." And she looked at that and she and and she asked if they homeschool if we homeschooled, and and Hannah told her yes, and. And everything like that. And maybe she'll be able to witness to her, you know, talk to her longer. But you know what? People are watching. They see the difference. They know. They look at that and they see the difference. Like there's something different about them. I could pick, I could pick those. A lot of times I can pick those people out when I'm at a crowd. If I'm at someplace as big as the state fair or if I'm somewhere, I can pick somebody out that's, that you can see it. Their spirit is different. By the way they walk and the way they handle themselves and the way they, they treat each other, that there's something different there. But those Muslim people, you know what? They, they, those ladies, they, they try to dress modestly. I mean, they do for the most part. But you know what? It makes them think, well, why do you do it? There is no law, Sharia law. There is no, there is no forced law. For us to do that, there's liberty. There's liberty in Christ, but there's a reason, right? It matters. It matters. Your testimony matters. We need godly couples today that, like these two, like Priscilla and Aquila, that they speak the same thing. They're driven by the gospel. Even their family business of tent making was done for the Lord, right? It was done for the glory of God. Husbands and wives ought to serve the Lord together just like this couple. You won't do the same things. There'll be different things. But, you, but everyone ought to be involved. Everyone. In whatever capacity God has, you ought to be involved. You ought to be serving. Husbands and wives together, serving the Lord praying together, supporting the ministry, supporting the Lord's work in that way by prayers and supplication and by tent making. Now, one of the reasons why, and I'll close here, but one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul uh, was a tent maker, I didn't, I didn't tell you this, but I, I forgot about this, but one of the reasons why, uh, where he was from, Cilicia, where he was from, there was a material that, uh, that was made only there, and it was made out of goat's hair, and Paul learned in the town that he was in, yeah, they made tents out of goat's hair. So Paul learned that trade because he grew up in that town and his, his mother or father sent him to go learn how to make tents from that goat's hair that was produced right there. It was like one of the, Cilicia was one of the major places for go, to, to get goat's hair to make tents. So Paul learned that at a young age. So some of you young men, I want you to think about that. You never know what's going on around you, the trades, the different things that you can learn and the things that are going on right around you that God may use later on in your life 
and it may be used more than just to take care of your needs or your family's needs. It may be for the furtherance of the gospel that God uses that. So don't despise learning and teaching. When, when your dad or other men want to teach you something, be willing to learn those things. You never know what God's going to do. And you ladies, the same way, there's things that you're going to learn in homemaking and you're going to learn around the house and you're different things like that. Don't despise that if somebody wants to teach you something and you can learn something about that. You may, it may be used later on in life. She worked with her husband. Right? They did it together. You never know what God's going to do, what God's going to... So be open to that to learn something. Don't turn... Don't turn a deaf ear to that, but be willing to learn. Be willing to grow. You're going to see the Apostle Paul. He's going to be tent making here, and then he's going to get into preaching, and then pretty soon uh, Timothy and I think it's Silas are going to come, and then things are really going to get heated up. And they're going to, Paul's going to be there for 18 months, and he's going to plant a church there. He's going to see a lot of fruit there, and God's going to do a major work there. And coming off his Athens trip that was kind of rough, he comes into Corinth and he takes some roots. He's going to be there for a while. And God's going to use him uh, to plant one of the most known churches. And we have two letters, First and Second Corinthians, that is a vast, a wealth of knowledge for the churches. And God uses that. So you're going to see a lot of those things coming up here. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you uh, for your words. Thank you for the truth, for the instruction that you give us. May it edify our hearts. May we learn and grow from the scriptures. And Lord, help us. Guide our steps and direct our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be submissive to your word. Help us to be teachable and willing to learn. Help us to grow and help our marriages to be godly marriages. That, Lord, we, if called upon to do something for you, would be ready spiritually to do just that. Thank you, Father, for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.